Okay, you all will get the notification. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I really appreciate your interest and enthusiasm in the things we're doing here in EKU Online and beyond, because I think what we do is always applicable to uh, higher ed in general. With uh, us today in presenting is Myra Beth Bundy and Matt Winslow, both professors in the EKU Department of Psychology. I, I will say they're progenitors of the EKU online uh, psychology offerings and probably some other folks too over there. And they're gonna talk to us about their best practices from their years of experience in psychology, online teaching. And from that, please take it away. All right. Well, it's good to see all of you. I'm gonna share my screen and, and get our PowerPoint going up here. So um, Dr. Bundy and I are, are getting the ba band back together again. We, uh -huh. We've fought together in the past and uh, um, yeah, so we're, we're happy to be here and we've just got a little bit of introduction stuff about us in case you don't know who we are. I think probably many of you do, but just in case. Dr. Bundy, you wanna take it away? Sure, I can't remember. I always count my years differently. 26-ish years at EKU, um, 18 years teaching online. That one I've got for sure because it was my second born child who motivated me to learn how to teach online. Um, and it, maybe an interesting fact about me is I'm a technically terrible person. So hopefully that's inspirational for you. Um, I, you know, I need a lot of support. Now, Matt, Matt can, is really great at tech stuff. I'm not. And yet I managed, I guess, to, to pull other strengths in and still do a pretty good job teaching online. Yeah, I, I do simple stuff. I can't do fancy stuff, but um, I still manage to have a lot of fun with it. I teach study abroad as well. That's about the only face-to-face -face, uh, teaching I have left these days. I do a lot of clinical teaching and supervision. I was supervising students until uh, 1059 this morning. And I've got to go ba right back and do it again once we finish here. And then my best fun is hanging out with students in person and online. I love to do it so much that even when I teach online classes, I always have uh, some synchronous opportunities. We'll talk about that because I love to hang out with students. Um, so, uh, come on. Yeah, there you go. I'm, I'm Matt Winslow and I haven't been here quite as long as Myra Beth, but almost. I think, I don't know, something's off with our count because I thought our years were closer than that, but you're I, I probably have, I, I think I'm on 24 now. Yeah. Anyway, an old timer. And I've been teaching online for about 10 years. Um, so not as long as Myra Beth. Um, and I, I have to say that um, when we started talking about really getting online as a department, um, I mean, Myra Beth had been doing it already, but um, when we started doing it as a department, I was sort of skeptical about it. I wasn't, I wasn't really enthusiastic about it because like Myra Beth, I really like hanging out with students in person. And I thought, you know, um, the in-person stuff is really what gets me going. Why would I want to teach you online? Uh, but then we uh, sort of smartly decided as a department, thanks to our former chair, Bob Brubaker, kind of pushing us, uh, we got online and um, yeah, it's been great. I, I, really, I really enjoy uh, teaching online and I really have learned a lot about teaching in general from teaching online. So um, that's a big deal. Um, and some of you know, but my fun fact is that I, I don't grade in, you can actually even teach an online course without grading, which um, is a little weird, but it's possible. And um, so if you wanna, we can, we can talk more about how that works. We'll talk about it a little bit, but we can talk about that more if you want um, and near the end. So uh, that's just a little bit about us. Um, we thought today we'd, we'd give you some practical tips and then talk about some larger themes um, that we think are important both in general and also right now. Uh, so just kicking off our practical tips, you know, um, this is the, the number one mistake that I made when I got into online teaching was, I just, I mean, I remember very distinctly, I was gonna put one of my courses online. I would go to my in-person version of that class, do my lecturing thing, and then I would come right back to my office and just record that exact same lecture same PowerPoints, and it was fresh in my head, and I just recorded it, 
And so I had, you know, 45, 50 minute long lectures recorded that I just put up on, on Blackboard. And I was like, hey, here we go. This is it. <laughs> and um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's very cool. cute that you thought that would work. Yeah. And I'm sure your lectures were brilliant if someone, you know, if students would have <laughs> would have watched them. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've learned that that didn't work. Um, so lecturing is, is a tough one. You know, how to deliver content online is tough um, because we're just so used to thinking about, well, you know, I'm in class and I'm going to deliver the content by lecturing it. And we just know from so much subtle research that that's not a good strategy for any kind of class, but definitely not for a class where you're sitting at your computer and there are a million other things you could be doing on your computer at the moment. You know, all these other distractions that we all have. Um, lecturing is just a, a, a terrible idea. Um, and, and, you know, eCampus, IDC people will tell you that students are not going to watch long videos. Um, it's just you know, um, in person and online, I don't think students are going to, you know, sit through long lectures and get much out of them. So I bet that's a tough one. Um, you know, we I, not that I use TED Talks a lot. I mean, TED Talks are great. I love TED Talks, and I use TED Talks in some of my classes sometimes. But but really, I I just put this in there to to point out that, you know, the maximum length of a TED Talk is eighteen minutes. Right. That's the there's no TED talk that's longer than that. I don't think I mean, that's that's their rule and many more shorter. But, you know, TED talks. Um, people spend months working on their TED talk, polishing it, crafting it. They have a whole team of fear at the real TED conference. They have a whole team of experts working on your visuals and your delivery and coaching you. I mean, it's it's a huge process to go through to create that one thing and none of us have time to do all of that for every day that we have class or every week that we have an online class. So no, no one's, um, I, I've never, you know, done anything that was as polished as a TED talk, much less a whole bunch of them for a class. So if that's kind of the ideal, I mean, you know, no, we're all falling short, I think. So, um, but I will say this, if you join, you know, if you join a, a faculty group, you know, where, where faculty are getting, and I, Matt, what, what are the names of these things? I, I've been in them before, but I don't know the names of them. These little faculty groups where you come up with a teaching product. A PLC. Yeah. So if you join a PLC where there's a teaching product example, I, I think, I don't know if Matt, Matt may have edited them out, but I've got a couple of my products from those uh, in here. You, you can come up with a few you know, higher effort products, yeah. you know, let's say you teach four classes. Well, you might try to produce four, you know, really nice products. Anyway, that's kind of what I do. I kind of try to spread it around. This one's for this class, this one's for this class. So they're at least getting some exposure to something that I've spent a little more time on and had more assistance with mixed in with some, some lighter effort stuff. I do these stories of the week there. I call them Bundy stories of the week. And it's just a silly picture of me you know, and a five minute story related to the big idea for the week. And my students kind of like those. Sometimes when I'm doing a, a, a synchronous thing, somebody will say, hey, that reminds me of your story of the week. And I'm like, hey, somebody listen to it. You know, somebody listen to my story of the week. So if you can come up with a theme for a short little mini lecture um, and, and it's not too aversive to them because they know the stories of the week will be very short. And I try to make them entertaining. Anyway, that's what I try to do instead of a lecture. I do, I do short, small themed you know, little talks. Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, eight to 10 minutes is what people tell us, right? Um, so I think that's a really good idea. You know, uh, I, I've tried to create some shorter things that are higher, higher quality. I'm not, I, I, have, I have to admit, I did take some of them out <clears throat> from this presentation just for because of time. Yeah, is your but, matrix, are you gonna show them your matrix thing? No, no, it, you know, that's whatever. I, I, it was really cool. It's cool. I mean, that, that was a course introduction video just to say, hey, and it was really like like an advertisement for my course or like a trailer, you know, like a trailer for my course. But but Myra Beth has, you know, some really nice, you know, content um, focused uh, videos that were really, you know interesting, had good visuals. And um, yeah, the IDC can help with those things, too. They've got a lot of skills 
Um, so uh, I think, you know, both of us have relied heavily on the IDC, you know, um, to, to help us with really every aspect of the course. And I mean, I don't know, Vicki works at the IDC, so she knows she can tell you too, but um, when you get into eCampus, um, the IDC is, I mean, we should have just started out with this, basically it's a huge resource and they are incredibly good at what they do. And, you know, um, you have to have your, if you're teaching an eCampus, your course has to be approved by the IDC, you have to go through the approval process and quality matters, but really, I mean, it's, it's such, a, such a good thing because it, it's kind of standardizes how courses work, modular structure and these kinds of things, but it also makes sure that it's, it's of good quality, which is, which is really important. So um, our first tip should have been lean into the IDC and, and really get them, you know, trust what they're telling you and, and use their expertise and their talents. And, and that is, I mean, for me, that was, that was you know, I don't know, 80 or 90% of making my course good was paying attention to what they say. So um, that's, that's a huge tip. Um, there are a bunch of people who are using podcasts now. I think podcasts are, are, are really popular um, for online courses. Um, the, the cool thing about a podcast, of course, is that you can take it with you, right? Students can download it maybe, um, and they can listen to it while they're doing other things, while they're driving or working out or making dinner or whatever. And so if you can make, make something that doesn't require visuals um, and you can just put out a podcast, um, I think, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, I listen to podcasts all the time. I don't know how often students listen to podcasts truly. I think eCampus students are probably more likely to listen to podcasts than our kind of Campus One students. But um, I think it's a great idea. I, I have not done it yet, but I know people who do it. And there are lots of podcast platforms and it's relatively easy to do. I mean, you could record onto your computer basically and make an audio file that, that students could just download and it would be great. So um, I think podcasts are a really cool idea. Yeah, I haven't done it either, but I've heard a lot of students talk about listening to them and liking them. I think that yeah. has more potential. Could be easier than, you know, the visual heavy materials for you to create too. That's right. That's right. And it's also, you know, I mean, I, I feel like after I listen to podcasts, you know, a few episodes on a podcast of the same person, they're really, um, I want to say intimate. That's maybe not the right word, but I really feel like a connection to the person. I mean, listen to that person's like in my headphones, you know, like their voice in my head is really a connection that um, I think, you know, can do a lot for our students feeling like they are connected to us. And that's really important. I'm not a big podcast fan. How long are podcasts usually? Oh God. I think generally, I don't know, people can answer too. I, a lot of them are half an hour. Um, some are, there's other, also there, some that are hours, but I've listened to ones that are more than two hours long, not all at once, but that's a good thing. You just pause it, stop it, go do something else, come back to it. Um, so, I think a podcast could be longer than the eight or 10 minutes a video is, um, which is, which is nice. So Chris is saying nine to 10. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, a lot of flexibility depending on how much you have to say. And the other thing about a podcast, and this is true of videos too, if you put them on the right platform is that you can speed up podcasts and, and speed up videos too. So you can watch them at, you know, 1.5 speed or two, two speed twice as fast. And, you know, um, that's, I mean, I do it, you know, and I, I can get something out of the podcast if it's listening to them faster. And so that's, that's a nice thing. Um, oh, 20 minutes of an industry practitioner. Oh, I love that. That is a great idea. That's cool. Thank you for that. That's neat. Um, all right. I want to be mindful of our time. Um, so quizzes and tests assessments generally uh, that's, this is a hard thing there can be a hard thing for online teaching um, and we I, I tried to we try to make this a presentation that focuses on the psychology because that's that's who we are so psychologists would tell you that retrieval practice is what is the best way to think of a test or a quiz right so it's it's not so much a a, a test of what they know as it is a way to help them learn it better, right? So when you when students answer questions on a quiz or, or a test, 
that's a learning activity. It's, it's not, it's, it's better thought of as a learning activity than it is really a, an assessment activity of what they know. Um, and so when you think of it that way, then some things, um, some things kind of changed in my mind. And so for, for my online tests, I, I have quizzes that they can take as many times as they want. And I, I use a test bank, so it draws questions from the, from the test bank randomly. And so every time they take the quiz, they get a different set of questions, sort of. But I say to them, look, you can take this as many times as you want, because the more times you take it, the more you're going to do this retrieval practice. And so students see that as a win because they're, they can take it until they get, you know, whatever grade they want on that quiz. Um, so if they want to get 100%, they can do it until they get 100%. And I've had students take a quiz 10 times, 12 times. I mean, you know, so they're really going at it. Um, and so the more they, they do it, they think they're winning in terms of their grade. But of course, it's a learning win too, which so means everyone wins. Um, yeah, Matt does that, right, Matt? You do you do pre questions, pre, sort of pre pre content questions, and then and then have students go back and revisit the question post content. In some classes, I do, yeah. Um, and I know that the um, the QEP people are really big on that. Um, like I've I've heard um, Jill, um, what's Jill's last name? Parrot. Parrot. Thank you. Golly, I've heard her talk about those kinds of devices that are kind of a pre-reading, kind of a preview and gets students to think about stuff before that they do the reading and then they can come back to it. Um, I think that is sort of a circular thing that is really nice. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's really great stuff too. Um, so this is one of the benefits of teaching online is that, you know, students can take the quiz if you allow them to, they can take it as many times as they want. Um, and I also think, you know, all this, concern people have about um, cheating on, on online tests and quizzes and the Proctorio and the lockdown browser and the video, 360 degree video of their room and all that stuff. That, that really, I, I don't like that. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, but I, I, I'd rather much rather just say, you know, look, all my quizzes are in effect open book. I'm not gonna worry about you using your book or anything. Um, you know, I'm not, not really excited if they use like Course Hero or something where they're actually the exam questions with the right answer. So they just look at the, that doesn't require them to do much processing. So that's not great, but you know, if they wanna do that, if that's what they need to do, I, you know, I don't know, I guess I just feel like that's on them. Anyway, um, so that's how I think about quizzes and tests at least. open book and ask application questions. I mean, you know, um, yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. I, and, and that's what I do in my in-person classes too. It's like, and I've heard other people say lots of times, if, if someone can Google the answer to your question, then you're not asking the right question. Because, you know, it's, it's not like Googling, it's not because Googling is easy and it's easy way out. It's because Googling is the way we all find out information, right? I mean, I, I learn about stuff all the time on Google and YouTube and Wikipedia. And, you know, if, if we're asking them things that they can just Google, then what's the point of being at a university, right? I mean, they could just, oh, I want to learn about this. I can just search on Wikipedia. What, what are we doing? So what we can bring, what value we can bring is by getting them to think about things in a different way. So yeah, sure, find information out wherever you can get it. And hopefully you get it from the course materials. But asking application questions or synthesis questions or, you know, those higher order questions that there isn't the answer on Wikipedia to um, really gets them to think and, and really absorb that material. So I think that's a much better way of doing it. I think a challenge we're having, or a challenge I'm having, I do a lot of that. It's like there, there is no way to cheat on this because every person's answer is going to be different. So, right. you know, I just I don't worry about cheating. It's just going to be whatever your answer is. However, for those questions, it takes more grading time. And as for, you know, for eCampus class, the, the number of students that are required to get a facilitator or grading assistant are increasing. 
And so I'm having to look, you know, it's like, am I having to go back to only multiple choice? I don't want to do that. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it gets to be a challenge when grading assistance is getting more difficult to get. So yeah. I think we're all, you know, we're wrestling with that. And, and funny enough, Michael, I actually really enjoy, I, I find it really meditative to sit and, and grade. It's really, it's very fun for me. On the other hand, I tend, you know, if I'm spending all weekend on it and I don't see my kids at all, then I have to, you know, I have to question about whether I should be doing that or not. It's always a, it's always a challenge. In fact, just last weekend, I was saying to one of my kids, okay, I have two class, you know, I have two of these this eight weeks, next eight weeks, I only have one, you know, so I promise I'll cut my grading time and we'll be able to do some more stuff. So the, you know, I just have to, it's the work-life balancing. I think we have a slide on that and it's something we all have to we just have to balance, you know, may, maybe for eight weeks, only four of the weeks have those kinds of questions, right? For the future, if, if I can see for the future that the university is not going to be able to support my old grading assistance the way I used to have it, I think when I redevelop my classes, instead of having those kinds of questions every week of the eight, you know, maybe I'll only have them for four. I'm, I'll just keep, I'll keep working on it, figure, you know, figuring out the balance. Yeah, that's good. Um... We also believe in having consistent weekly deadlines and really a routine is really important. And again, I think the IDC does a great job of creating that structure, the modular structure that um, students just kind of, they, they figure it out, okay, this is how it works and it's gonna work this way, you know, seven of the eight weeks or six of the eight weeks or whatever. So they know what's going on is really good. Um, and, you know, it's good for us too, right? It helps us but it helps the students as well, um, you know, and it helps students with procrastination. So they know, you know, um, you gotta have, you gotta get these things done. And eight weeks is such a short amount of time that there, you just can't, you can't screw around. You can't put it out. I mean, you can't put it off for a, a week. I mean, if you just, you know, ghost from an online class, an eight week class for a week, you're going to be in trouble, right? I mean, that, that's, a lot happens in a week, so you got to be. And stuff is still coming. You know, if you're making up old stuff, new stuff has come in. My, what I find is, I'm just, you know, I, I demonstrate to them the first week because the material disappears after the deadline, and I always get emails saying, "Hey, where's our stuff? Oh, the week's over. Now we're on the next week. What?" And then, so that's their, you know, then they realize, oh, that's how it's going to be. And of course I'm flexible, right? The first week it's like, okay, here's how we're going to do it. You can still turn it in. And then usually I don't get too much of that after that because they can see that they've got the week and then they need to get it done within the week. Now that, that's for graduate students. I can, I can see, I can have more challenges with undergraduates, although not as much as you might think once that first week goes through. And again, I, I would say that E-campus students, the traditional e-campus students are, you know, much more focused on that stuff. And I, I don't have very many problems at all with e-campus students following that stuff. They, they have so many other things going on in their lives that they have to schedule this to get it done. And I, I also feel like, you know, the traditional e-campus student who's coming back to higher education from after, you know, years of working oftentimes, you know, they're, they're here for a reason, right? They're really motivated to get the benefits, to get this stuff, to learn this stuff. They're not here to fool around. And so, and they have all these other things going on, family and work and all this sort of stuff. They are on it, right? I mean, they're, 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 these are the students who are, you know, printing out the schedule and putting it on their refrigerator and, you know, just making time for it. And um, yeah, I, 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 I have students who are, he will help me by catching the mistakes in the schedule. Oh, it says here, it says it's due on this date, but over here, it says it's due on this date. Which one is it? And I'm like, oh, that was just a, my mistake. You know, I just didn't, wasn't consistent in my blackboard. So nope, here's the one that's really the real one. And so, and they're, they're on it, you know, it's, it's, it's good. Um, the other thing we want to say is uh, talk about these third party resources. Um, you know, there, there's just kind of an endless supply of these things, right? There's just always another other platform that uh, comes around and says, hey, you should use this. I mean, so the, the ones with the textbooks that you might get, like from Pearson or McGraw-Hill that are, you know, can be really built into Blackboard. And so it's relatively seamless. And so some of those work really well. Um, others like Perusal is, it's really, 
you know, the, when students, I don't know if you know what perusal is, but it's great. It's a wonderful thing. I use it a lot and I believe in it, but it is, a, they, students get to it through Blackboard, but it takes them to another platform, another website. And it works differently than Blackboard does. And, you know, just be aware that there is a learning curve with these things. And, you know, students are, I mean, eCampus students are only taking two classes at one time. Uh, but, you know, if they have to learn a new platform for every class, that's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of fatigue and a learning curve. And um, so, you know, I, I believe in them. You, I'm just curious, do any of you use any of these things? What is it, Connect, Rebel? I, I'm trying to think of what Cengage's is, because uh, I use it. Do you know, Matt? Uh, I've forgotten what it uh, is. It's, I'm, I'm spacing out on it. I've, I've used Connect. Well, I, I just used it for a winter break class. Whatever Cengage's is, I use. Anybody but us use those? Is that a psychology thing? Um, I know in um, English, we're using Perusal for the English courses. Um, I have like an art class that I think uses Pearson. Um, but the, the courses I'm generally responsible for, so like the MPA program, paralegal, political science, they don't really use a lot of the third party type programs. You know, I, again, it's, uh, I've just been thinking about using something called Critic, which is like a peer feedback facilitation platform, which I really think peer feedback is important and the students are not good at it. Um, so I, I want to use it, but it's not only is it a different platform, it works totally different than anything else I've seen. It's also costs money and Booksmart won't pay for it at this point. So, you know, students would have to pay 24 bucks for it, which is, you know, now that their books are free, it's not so bad, but still I'm like, I don't know. So I'm, you know, I, I do, I love the way it works. Actually, I think it works really well and it's an important skill, but it's just another thing for them to learn. And I just, I, I just haven't pulled the trigger on my online classes. Um, I do it quite a bit for my undergraduate classes and then it's not nothing is available for graduate classes right so I have to create my own content so it just depends on I'm, if I'm in my undergraduate or my graduate hat yeah, uh, right. and even when I use it for undergraduate what I find is when you talk to these uh, representatives they the, the amount of stuff they want you to have your students do on these platforms is just it doesn't make any sense it would be completely yeah. overwhelming so I tend to just pick you know one week Let's say uh, Connect uh, has these really good videos, they do, uh, for an abnormal psychology class that I teach. Well, instead of having students do the 40 <laughs> per week that you know, <laughs> be available, I might, I probably have them do two, like a clinical video and then a, you know, a research content video, and that's all I use. So to me, I use them as a supplementary, interesting, well done material as opposed to the main content of the class. Cool. Um, so those are just some of the practical tips. Now there's just some themes that, larger themes that we think are important too. Um, so here, here are the five themes. You know, I'm not gonna, I mean, student engagement uh, that doesn't surprise anybody, right? That's you know, something that we're all concerned about in all of our classes and it's a challenge even more um, during the pandemic um, than it has been. But um, some of the other ones I think are, are, are important as well. So I don't, we, we, we could, you know, there, I think there are other people have been doing whole sessions on student engagement. So we're, we're not going to spend too much time on it because other people talk about it, you know, in depth more, but there definitely are things that are sort of unique or have been traditionally unique to online classes uh, that really are about engagement, like discussion boards. Um, you know, that that's, uh, seems like a so really frequent common piece of lots of online classes. Not that you can't do them in your per in-person classes too, but um, you know that's a really easy student engaged thing. It's, it's not, I don't think it's foolproof. I think that students can get tired of them after a while. And I get tired of them after a while, you know, and all the, the rules that we try to create about, you know, you gotta post once and then have two responses and, I never get tired of them because I make them really interesting and fun. I, I make the question something that the students 
like and and the question is something that I can't wait to get on there and see what the students say about it. So yes. yeah, I think you have to do them carefully. And I, I started out using them when I started out. I I, I used them in a terrible way. It was you know stupid questions like, you know, what was the most interesting thing from the readings for this week? It's, 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 a, it's a bad question. It sounds like a good question, but you know, students are just like, oh God, you know, and then they have to <laughs> respond to somebody, and it's it, it's you know, it, but I think you I'm. I'm I've gotten better at them and I don't think I'm as good as Meyer Beth, but um, yeah, making them really interesting. That's the way to get students. I mean, students can get really into them. I mean, they can have a back and forth and that's great. Um, so you can do them well. Um, you know, group projects are never easy, uh, no matter what you do <laughs> in any kind of class, but I, I've, I've not done them a lot in my own classes, but I have done them. And, you know, it's, I think it's, my experience has been that they're harder for these e-campus students who have jobs and families and their schedule is, you know, all over the place and um, they're not consistent across students. So some students work second shift or, you know, and then people are on, you know, West Coast time. And so to get them to work together in any synchronous fashion is really difficult. Um, and so it, it's a challenge, but um, I, I do still think that group projects are beneficial. If for no other reason, then, you know, a lot of jobs, careers require people to work together. And it's good for them to get that experience, to get better at it. I do kind of a combo where I have them do an individual project, but then I have a little rubric that they have to exchange. And, you know, I assign partners, they have to review each other's, da, 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 they get credit. You know, it's usually their discussion for the week, so they feel good because they get a break from that. That way, it's a little, it's a little interaction, but it's they still have their own individual work. I don't know. I, I do a fair amount of that kind of assignment, and the students seem to like it, and they feel good because they're getting some points toward their final project by getting it reviewed. And I make a big deal out of what an act, what an act of trust and bravery it is to let somebody review your work, etc. I try to assign partners that I think will be good matches. Anyway, I do a fair amount of that. And it helps me because that means somebody has already had a look at the work before me and they might catch big problems and be able to support each other. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's huge. Um, and, and peer teaching, I mean, that, that's kind of an example of peer teaching, you know? I mean, they're, they're actually teaching each other about stuff. So they're learning from each other. I think that's really huge. I mean, um, you know, the, the web is, you know, in some ways so flat, right? Uh, there's no, there's not as much hierarchy. And that's one of the greatest things about the web is that it's really, that's one of the hardest things too. But, you know, it, I think it's, it's nice when we, I feel, I, I like it when I can harness that interconnected kind of um, know, democratizing of education, get them to teach each other, get them to connect with each other. All of that stuff is, is good stuff for online because I'm sure that you know that I, I think that a lot of people, a lot of students and faculty think that online teaching is very isolating experience for the students. They're just working on this themselves. And, you know, that, that's how the history of distance teaching was, right? I mean, you go back far enough and it was, you know, we're going to send you a videotape in the mail and you watch the videotape on your own. And then you, we're going to send you a test on the mail and you take the test on your own. It's, it's, you know, that's the way it had to be back then. But now with all this technology, we can have a lot more interaction. And I think that's, that's a really important feature of it. Here's one more thing I do that combine all those things. Their project might be a three minute teaching video. So that way they're doing a little project. Somebody reviews it before it's finalized. And then everybody gets to see it on the discussion board. So everybody's actually getting an additional layer of teaching, but I make them really short, just like two or three minute teaching pieces. A lot of times they're really funny. It's really cute. It might be in somebody's home and that's, you know, kind of connection creating. Sometimes people bring their family members or their pets into the projects. Um, I've had pretty good luck with those. People seem to like them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that. So empathy and compassion is, is a big deal. And it, it's especially true right now um, during this pandemic. I mean, hopefully the pandemic is easing up a little bit, although I just had an email this morning from a student who tested positive and, you know, I mean, it's, it's you know, 
you know, everyone knows where we are with it, but, you know, certainly the pandemic has, has reinforced the importance of empathy and compassion for me, um, just because I've heard these horrible stories, I'm sure you have too, from our students, all the things that they're they dealing with. Some of them were pandemic related. Some of them were just other things that were made worse by the pandemic, you know? Um, and so it's, it's just really difficult. And so, you know, now we have a lot of students who probably didn't want to be in online classes, right? I mean, um, even if they're, well, uh, this is true mostly for Campus One students who take eCampus students or eCampus e courses, but, you know, they may have wanted or have expected to be in person, but now they're online. So that's a challenge. Um, and so online is, is new to them. And, and, and for many of us, uh, not, uh, you know, not a, maybe not people in this call, but you know, we were forced to be online and the pivot and all that stuff. So that was a challenge. Um, but again, like for me, I really didn't know what they were dealing with as much before the pandemic as I as I am now. And um, you know, and and you know, frankly, they don't know what we're dealing with. Um, and so I've been more forthcoming about you know, the challenges I've had during the pandemic too, whether it's, you know, worrying about family members or it's um, just not being my brain not working as well as it used to. Languishing is a, is a, is a real thing that, that um, I think we're all dealing with. It's not, not burnout. It's not, I mean, burnout some, you know, but I think, I really think languishing is where we are. There's a whole, a great TED talk about that too, but, you know, um, it's a problem, you know, and I think our students are doing having that experience too. Um, I, I think structure is really helpful, but I also think flexibility is really helpful, uh, really important during this time, you know? And I, I used to be really strict about deadlines. Um, and I, I really thought this was a help for students, again, the procrastination and all that stuff. But um, during the pandemic, I, I really was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to just relax a lot about that because people have so much stuff going on, you know, that, you know, um, I don't think I've really been, I don't think students have taken advantage of that in a, in a, in a really dishonest way, hardly at all during the pandemic. I, I think, you know, and it's much more common for me to have students really give me, you know, tell me, oh man, you know, here's what's going on. And, you know, is there any, and I'm like, holy crap, man, that's, that's a lot. And please don't worry about my class. I, I can't tell you how many times I've said that on email or chat or whatever, please don't worry about our class. That's the last thing I want you to be thinking about right now. Please deal with all this other stuff and come back to my class, our class when you can, because, you know, it's just, if, I, if that was going on in my life, I, teaching this class would, would be pretty low on my list of priorities. And, you know, I, I, I'd want them to understand if I was in that situation and I've got to understand if they're in that, when they are in that situation. So, you know, um, you know, Myra Beth is, is different. We're all different about this, but um, that's how I've reacted to it. And, you know, I, I, I really try to tell them, you know, I mean, this is, again, this is something I should have been doing and I sort of did before the pandemic, but now I, I just really have, have made a more of a point of saying, hey, look, I really, I really want you to do well. And, and I'm creating this whole structure, right? I've got this whole course all laid out. And if you do these things, these are the benefits you're gonna get. And I really want you to get those benefits but I totally understand, you know, if life happens and you just can't get as much out of the class as you could have otherwise, that's just the reality. I mean, you know, that we can't ignore um, what's going on in the world around us. That's just not how teaching works or taking a class works. Um, it's just, you know, uh, and so I tell them, look, I, I will be understanding when you are not doing as well as you want to do. I totally get it. And 
I am asking them to do the same thing for me because again, I, I know that I'm not at my peak level of performance right now. Definitely not. And so I, I really ask them for their forgiveness in advance and their, their graciousness, you know, when I am not on things as quickly as possible, or I don't give feedback as fast as I, I would like to, or I forget things or, things are messed up in my course, the due dates are, you know, things are not consistent. Yes, that is a problem on normal times. And um, it's worse for me during this pandemic time. Um, so I, I think that's important, right? And, and I, I, really, I really have said, like, none of us are at our best right now. Let's do the best we can together on this. And I think that that has changed the way I thought, my, think about my students, uh, and thought about my classes um, a lot more. Yeah, definitely. You know, um, and I, you know, I had students tell me during the pandemic just terrible stories about working at fast food or working in the service industry, and you know, for for whatever reason they were considered essential workers, working at the grocery store or whatever. And so, I mean, not only do they have to work, and maybe more because some of their other family members couldn't work. And so now they're trying to get more hours to help their family. And then they were worried about, you know, working and being exposed to COVID. So they're not only is it the time, it's the stress level. I mean, it's a lot. Um, it, it's just really, you know, and, and just to just to recognize that and to say it out loud explicitly to them, you know, look, I, I, I know that you have a lot of stuff going on. I've got a lot of stuff going on that wasn't that wasn't going on before. I'm going to do the best I can. You're going to do the best you can. It's not going to be as good as we want it, right? I mean, it's just not. It, it, that's just the reality. I, I, I wish we, I wish that wasn't the reality, but it is. And I think, well, I, I don't know. I, I can't. I can't say for certain that it's helped my students to hear that. They've some of them have said that. But I know it's, I can tell you for certain that it's helped me feel better about it. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's just being honest and transparent with students. Um, and, that, and that really leads into the next big theme, which has become more important for me um, in the last few years in my teaching, uh, or at least more explicitly important to me, and that is trust. Um, and, you know, for, so for me, what this means is, um, you know, I, I tell them, my students, what the purpose is. Um, well, I'm gonna go back one thing. So yeah, if, if you police their work um, and for cheating or for, you know, just making them comply with your demands, then they're going to see you as an enforcer or a cop. And 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 I, I don't want to be seen that way by my students. I don't I don't want to be that person for them. I want to be a facilitator. I want to be a helper, um, and and not, yeah, not not a commander or a dictator or an authoritarian. Um, so. You know, I, I want to treat them with, with trust and respect. And I tell them, you know, you can cheat. I'm sure you can figure out ways to cheat. And that I can't do much about it. We've already talked about this a little bit. And I, I just, you know, keep on reminding myself that, you know, cheating is hurting them. It's not really hurting me any. I think um, the reason we make a big deal out of this is because one of the things that we see sometimes <laughs> You'd be surprised how many professors sort of spend a lot of obsessive time worrying about cheating, really going after cheaters. So we've always took the approach of, hey, you know, we're going to try to set up things so that cheating isn't really a thing and that, you know, there's not a lot of payoff for cheating. We're going to try to do it another way. Now, I have a graduate program that uh, involves patient care uh, and also passing a big certification exam. And it just happens to be set up so that uh, certification exam results are published. If EKU puts out a lot of people that can't pass the certification exam, it'll probably kill the program. So, you know, things are a little different there, but I still do my best to try to walk the middle path on it. 
Um, I have open book exams for, you know, for during, during the semester exams and I encourage them to use their notes and take their time. Um, I have a lot of quit pre quizzes that they can take all my little talks, my Bundy stories of the week, my little recorded lectures, they all have quizzing in there that they can do as many times as they want and look up the answers. And then I do have for each of those classes, there are seven classes in this uh, sort of set that they need for the certification. There's a proctored exam at the end. But I think even when you have a proctored exam, which sucks, nobody likes it, it's not fun. I still think your attitude about that proctored exam can make a difference, right? I don't have a, well, I'm gonna get you now. You know, we're doing a proctored exam. No, it's more like, yeah, let me explain to you why this is necessary because we're going for certification. I have to make sure that you have really good knowledge of the content and that you can answer test questions about the content. And if you can't, you probably need to take this class again because you wouldn't be ready for certification. So we're gonna proctor, let me support you. You know, we talk about it in our weekly stuff. This is how it's gonna work. Um, these are some approaches to dealing with the stress related to taking a proctored exam. So yeah, exactly. That's exactly right, Chris. So I'm in applied behavior analysis, but I use some of the same kind of proctoring approaches that nursing do just because I can't, I can't graduate people. I can't allow people to graduate that don't have the information and sadly that can't pass a high stakes exam on the material. But I still think even when you have to have to do that, your attitude and the way you approach a proctor kind of situation can, you know, can help people cope with it and hopefully succeed on it. Even people, you know, have people taking a class for a second time, no judgment from me. Glad you were willing to come back and do it again. And, you know, I can tell that you're learning more this time. I'm so happy that you were able to take the time to do that. So just a little bit more about trust. I know we're, we're coming up on the end of our time together. Um, so this is a, a tilt thing, a transparency and teaching and learning thing, but so we, we always tell students why they're doing things. I, I, I tell my students I have a no busy work policy. <laughs> like, and if they think, I tell them, if you think this is busy work, don't do it. Let me know that you think this is busy work. And, you know, maybe I can convince them otherwise, but if I can't, then maybe it really is busy work. So I'm going to tell them why they're doing things. And then I trust my, I trust my students to choose what to do based on what benefit they're going to get. And if they make an informed decision about what to do and I, they, they decide, oh, I don't want to do that because I don't think that's important for me. I want to, but I want to do this. I mean, especially eCampus, I mean, they're adults. I mean, I, and I don't teach, you know, in a program like Meyer Beth, my, my courses are not for certification or anything like that. They don't have to know this content at all. Um, so if they want to pick and choose that, I think that's great. So they choose what to do based on the benefits of doing that. And just in general, I trust my students to make their own decisions. And I tell them that explicitly, you know, look, you, you are in charge of this. Again, I've created this whole course and these are the things I've created for you to do. And they're all based on total research. And I know if you do this, this is the benefit you're gonna get, not because I have a hunch about it or because this is how I've always done it. It's because there's research about it. And so if you do this, I'm pretty sure you're gonna get this benefit, but you know, you choose which benefits you wanna get and do those things and, you know, they're in charge. Um, so it's a big, a big issue of trust. Uh, another big issue is communication, obviously is really, really important for students. And there's just so many different ways to communicate um, now with, with Blackboard and, you know, all these other platforms we could could be using. Um, so, you know, there's just all these different ways to communicate um, that, that we think is really important. Uh, you wanna say something about any of these? I just think one of, you know, the skills I lack, like Matt, you know, I lack the, uh, I lack your tech skills, but my communication skills probably are my saving grace. I'm a, I'm a fast grader, just as I expect students to do the, the week set of work during that week, 100% you know, barring death, I will be propping myself up in bed, you know, doing the grading and getting that feedback. And they, they usually like that a lot. They, they've got multiple ways to contact me. Uh, they'll use them and I try to get back to them as much as I can. I usually tell them if I don't respond within a day, it's gotten lost in my 200 emails for that day, please contact me again. You know, if, if I don't respond to email, try text. You know, I almost never have students abuse that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll usually give them my phone number just in case, I just, sometimes I'll just miss an email because my email volume is too high. I mean, believe it or not, 
any time a student has texted me, it is because I met, you know, I was negligent on an email. So I just, uh, I try to be super responsive. I guess that's my theme. That's my super strength is being super responsive to students that's huge. and really prioritizing that. But that brings us to <laughs> work-life yeah. balance. I can have some problems with work-life ba life balance because of that. Yeah, yeah. it's tough. I mean, you know, I, I, I think I'm just going to put all these up there. You know, it's like uh, teaching is a bottomless pit and teaching online is an even bigger bottomless pit. You can pour as much time into it as you can. And it's never enough. And, and so it, it's, it's, it's a boundaries issue. Um, you know, and so a lot of people say, and some people say, you know, look, I, this is when I'm going to respond to email between these times. So, you know, I'm not going to get back to you until this time. Some people do it that way. Don't respond in the middle of the night. Otherwise, students will think that you're going to expect that, you know, so you can set boundaries up. It's tough, um, but I think it's for your benefit and maybe for them as well. Um, but, you know, we've got multiple roles as an online instructor, right? We're, you know, therapist and IT and caregiver and all the tutors, all that stuff, you know, things that we're not trained in at all, uh, you know, uh, but they expect us to do all those things. Um, and we're our contact and we can, we can farm those things out to other people. We can connect people up with IT if they need it, and we can connect people up with the counseling center. We can do that, but we still have to do it, right? And we can put that in our Blackboard. If you're having these issues, contact these people, but we know that students don't always see that stuff. So it's a lot, you know, it's, it's really- I think it just depends on what you like to do, right? For me, yeah. I would just simply say, I'm a terrible IT person. I'm so sorry, I can't help you with that. Here's yeah. where you go. Um, but maybe Matt, you probably are a pretty good IT support person. So you might do some of that, you know, some yeah. minimal. So it depends on what is in your skill set. You know, I'm a psycho clinical psychologist. I can certainly give a nice empathic response that's really easy for me to do. It's a skill I have. I'm not going to do counseling, but I might do more caregiving type stuff than you might, Matt, just because it's a job set skill I have. Anyway, you have to keep the boundaries going. But I do think, you know, I, I would feel perfectly comfortable saying, oh, my goodness, I'm so sorry for your loss. You know, here are some resources, da, 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 just because that is in my wheelhouse. Now, a problem with getting Blackboard to work? Yeah, I don't know what to do. You know, I'll have to send you somewhere else to do that. Yeah. So that that is all we have. Just, we've kind of gone on a breakneck speed. I'm sorry, we don't have that much time at the end, but if you have any questions, we'd love to take questions. There are a lot of nice comments in the chat that I've been kind of looking at. So you may just want to look at some of those. Okay. You guys bring your video up. So let, let us see who you are, come on. <laughs> There you go. If, if you're clothed, if you're decent, let's see you. Hey, Steve. Hey, guys. What, what, uh, what department are you in, Steve? You guys just tell us who you, who you are. Uh, yeah, I'm in math. So um, I, I was listening to a lot of this and I'm, I'm, I, have, I do have a bunch of questions. Um, I don't know if we have time to talk about them, but- Get them started. Hi, um, James. I mean, one of the things I wrote in the chat um, was about uh, Matt's comments. Uh, I forget exactly what you were talking about, but it was online exams and quizzes and and you know the big thing in math is people want want us to assess students, right? Make sure that they know how to do you know A, B, and C, and so we get we get beat up about that a lot, and so it's it's really hard to uh, you know use use assessment tools as as learning tools as only learning tools, you know, yeah. and so I, I struggle with that. But I do, I, I, I do appreciate your comment about using them as, as learning tools because I try to do that with the exams after the fact. Yeah. Um, it, it's, but it, math is, I mean, the, you know, in some respects is, is much different, right? And we, um, and then the online, I, I struggle giving exams and quizzes online. You know, the pandemic, uh, I, I didn't mind lecturing on, on lecturing you were talking about lecturing i i actually had um actually pretty decent success with lecture um because i've done it before um and the problem i had was assessing you know and i would like to hear more about how we can assess students 
without them knowing that we're assessing them or, you know, like what you're saying is, you know, make it, make them believe that it's, it's really not about assessment, but we have to, I mean. Um, I would assume a lot of people have a lot of anxiety about assessment in math, especially in some more introductory classes. Yes. People are yeah. sweating the assessment there, just like my student, you know, my graduate students are sweating those proctored final exams. You know, I mean, some of what you can do, you probably already do is just be up front with them and say, this is the type, this is the, the stuff we're required to do assessment wise. You know, this is why we have to do it. This is how we want to support your experience. You know, tell us, tell us how we can support you in doing this. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the fall, I, I taught solely, I, I had all online classes. The only time I was on campus was for my exams. I set up the courses so that we could be in person. And I think that made all the difference with the courses because I at least I saw the students the first day of class in person. Then once we got online after that, you know, I sort of knew them, right? Yeah. And then we saw each other every every like you know six weeks. And then the exams were done in class, and it's much easier to administer a class. And I think the or an exam. And I think the students are are you know have an easier time with it as well when it's when it's not on a computer and they're stressing about whether their lockdown browser is going to lock up or the person on examity is going to give them a hard time about which right. calculator that I mean all of those things melt away we have you know the exam we use what's called examity I don't know how, how many other disciplines I've use used it, it. But, um, well let me tell you how I approach that this is what I, I really am firm about this in in print and in when in my my meetings are all online, but you know, we're together just like we're all together here. What I say to them is don't forget examity or response monitor work for us. You know, who's the final person that's in charge? I'm the final person that's in charge. So if examity has gone wrong, you know, you can always contact me. You know, it's like if I, and I have done this, if I have to personally proctor your exam over oatmeal on Saturday morning with my family, I've done this, I will do it. So we're gonna do that. We're all gonna do the best we can to get examity to work. If something goes wrong with that, then you come to me, I will, we will make it right. I will make it right. So they know, I mean, you know, people cry over this, right? People cry over examity. They cry over respondents monitor. And I always say, if you, if you think you're starting to cry, you know, come to me, text me, text me when the tears are starting to fall and we're going to figure out some way to make this work. So I've had a pretty good, uh, I've had pretty good luck with that. It, it still is a pain but I've made it better, but I appreciate you. You're just like, I'm going to skirt this. You know, I'm going to have people, I'm going to, I'm going to make my course designation such so that I can personally proctor exams at one time Yeah. in my classroom. Yeah. When you see those people, you're seeing them at the, at the beginning and during exams, but do you also see them on Blackboard Collaborate through, throughout your teaching? Oh, I, I, I do all synchronous online yeah. stuff. I don't, I don't like you to really do are seeing them, not their body, you know, not face, not, not yeah. in, in real life, but you are seeing them at least uh, through Zoom, if you can get yeah. it. Uh, bring yeah, up depending on the group, it, I mean, you can get a fair number of students to turn their cameras on, but, you know, you get that one group where only one person is willing to do it, and then they see no one else is doing it, and, and, you know, back to being a police, you can't, come on guys, turn you, you can't constantly ask them to do it because then you become that person or, you know, the person they hate because you, they have to turn their camera on. Yeah. But a lot of times I'll do some bonus stuff and, and, you know, I'm real upfront about it. I'll say, Hey, it's, it's more fun for me when I can see you, I'll do this bonus stuff for you, but I totally get that some people, it doesn't work for you to be seen. And I'm okay with that too. So yeah, I, I would never require video ever. But but sometimes I will pay, you know, I'll give them a bonus, a small bonus if, if they do video. It kind of helps with the, uh, and the sometimes people will email me and say, this is why I can't do video. And then I just say, I totally get it. No problem at all. You know, and if you want another way to earn bonus, you know, I've got these other options too. So that kind of keeps it video-ish, you know, mostly, mostly people being on video. Do, do you teach any hybrid classes where you have both online students and students in the classroom? Well, I teach hybrid classes, but the way mine are is that sometimes we're all in person and sometimes we're all online, but I have guessed it in those, those, you know, where you've got people in different sites, it gets more complicated, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was used to before the pandemic. I run a course every two years that we run that way and that works well. The students that are outside, they, you know, there's all a few of them. They're usually graduate students for us and they, they're, they're pretty forgiving about being ignored because yeah. um, at times you just forget that they're there 
Um, but the, the eCampus classrooms actually help a lot with the communication because the audio is so good in those rooms. It is, yeah. That, yeah. Those, um, yep. Jan, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say um, one of the issues I work with the University Training Resource Center. We train state social workers. It's a contract. And that is one of our requirements for our people who are going through training class, whatever verbiage we want to use, is that they must have their video on or notify us why they cannot because we have to, uh, because of liability issues as we train, um, uh, have to show that they were actually in class. <laughs> that's right. And that's kind of it. I myself, I hate being on camera. Um, I'm I'm here, I'm participating. I got two pages worth of notes because it helps me to remember things if I write it down. And I just wish I could make, um, find a way for us to do that without making people be on camera for four hours at a stretch. Yeah, that's tough. And there's so, yeah, I don't know who's, who are taking those class, those class of trainings that you're talking about, but a lot of our students, you know, they, they just don't have a place where they feel comfortable turning the camera on. It's their bedroom or they've got family stuff going on or it's, you know, it's, they're just, you know, they, they don't want that intrusion. And, you know, um, but I, I, I get wanting to know, I mean, I, I've, I've had uh, synchronous during the pandemic when our classes just got pivoted. I, I had synchronous sessions like this and it's all black screens and it's like, that's tough. I mean, it's just tough to talk. It is, it's hard to train to a uh, black screen, you know. Um, I tell you those students love to chat. I do, so when my, I do these week, so for each of my online classes, I do a weekly, uh, I call them Blackboard Collaborate Reviews. You can attend live or you can watch the video. And if you watch the video, you have an assignment you have to complete that the student, that the live students and I create on the spot. So you actually have to watch the video to get it. And they, they just love to chat. I mean, you know, I get them warmed up with, hey, it's snowing here. What's the weather? You know, oh my goodness. You know, my, one of my kids just brought me a snack. It's great. What are you guys snacking on? We do it in the evening. So I, I get them started like that. They love to chat. Man, they, they just chat my head off. Most of them do keep their video off. It's very rare that I see one of them. They'll occasionally do voice, but what they love to do is type in that chat box. So I don't know if you could have those opportunities. Your trainings may be so large that it would be difficult to manage that. Our, our issue is um, we can only train between eight and four. Well, okay, so you could do it. It's a work the day I issue. Do is I have a lot of quizzes. So I'll present a concept and then I have little quiz questions. And then I always say, you know, it's okay if you miss it. No problem, just try. I make, I make them vote, you know, A, B, C, or D. Then we discuss. Uh, I, I put their names in there. So let's say I have 25 students. Well, in my little quiz question, it's it's applied behavior analysis. So it's their names. I put their names in there and they get a kick out of that. I'm like, oh, Matt's not here tonight, but don't worry. He'll see this on video. Ha, ha, ha. I try to make it funny. They get a kick out of it. They'll come in and they'll say, hey, you never made me an example. I'm going to do something about that right now. I got a good one. I, I make them give examples. I go back. We laugh. I just try. It's like It's like the Bundy comedy and teaching hour. And they'll 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 do a lot to try to get there live because they want to be they want me to interact with them in that way. Right. So I just try to make it uh, as entertaining as I can, but I also really push content. You know, I, I've got a lot of stuff I'm trying to uh, get across, and that it's one hour per week. Yeah, you could. I mean, if you were more creative and better at tech than me, right? You could do all kinds of different stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm old school, I guess. One weekly hour. But at least I do have the sense, Chris, to know that I have to record it, right? And to provide a participation opportunity for people that need to watch the recording. I've got this one lady in Saudi Arabia. Do you know she gets up in the middle of the night so she can attend live? I tried to get her to do the video and she's like, it's just not as good. I'd rather be here live. So I think it's maybe 3.30 in the morning, her time when she does it. She sets an alarm once a week, gets up and does the live thing and then goes back to bed. So people must enjoy it. That's huge. That is awesome. I guess we're out of time. Here I go off on one of my Bundy stories of the week. Yeah, we, we, I want to respect your time. So it's, it's 12.06. So um, yeah, anybody, anything, one last thing or? 
Thanks, Let me just plug time. IDC and, and say, please lean on us. Faculty needs support. That's well documented. We get paid to help. We feel like we're helping the students when we help you, at least I do. And we have many talented people. So if you're eCampus connected, please reach out. And if even if you're not, uh, get in touch with me. I'll do my best to get you the help and the resources that you need, because that's, to me, y'all do too much and you should lean on others whenever you can. And we're here. So sorry to plug that. Yeah, we could, you know, not, none of these things I'm talking about could I have done without IDC helping me. I didn't even know how to use Blackboard Collaborate. In fact, I think Jonathan Sakura, when the pandemic broke out, I was like, help me. I'm very old. I need help using Blackboard Collaborate. So, you know, he showed me how to do it. I didn't know how to use Respondus Monitor. I had to get IDC to put all that stuff in my courses, you know, on and on. They, they can help you out. Endless, endless help, that's for sure. Thank all you right. all so much for doing this today. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you guys so Bye, much guys. for attending. You made it really fun for us. Great Thanks ideas. Any questions if you have any. Bye. All right, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Email Dr. Winslow. He'll answer all your questions, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs>